But this song was written by a guy called Lanny Wolf. And Lanny is probably a contemporary. I, th I think he's still living. And, uh, but he just wrote this chorus. I've always loved this little chorus, so we might, we might end up doing this someday and singing it in church. But you know, there's something different about Jesus. He's just so loving and so forgiving and so merciful and so gracious that he can save a wretched person, a sinner. And that's what we are. We're converted sinners. We still sin, but we're converted. And he does that. He changes that. And there's no one else that can do that in your life. And there is a change that happens. There's something that's different about him. For his voice has calmed the angry, raging sea. There's something different about him. I love this. For his touch has changed a sinful wretch like me. Now, all of you know what 1 Corinthians 13 is, right? It's a love chapter. All right. I'm going to talk to you today about the character of God. Kind of deals with what we find here in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 13. But also it deals with some other aspect of God that I also want us to remember. And uh, hopefully we'll never lose that concept of God, who he is, and what he, uh, well, what kind of character he is. Uh, so we're going to talk about this from 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, which naturally is the chapter on love. Now the last section, the last part of the preceding chapter in verse 12 after he has talked about all these wonderful gifts that God has given he says but I'm going to show you a still more excellent way and then he talks about this if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Father in heaven, we would ask that you would grant us the grace to understand a little bit more about your character because God, you have said in your word that you are love. And that if we abide in love, in you, then we are your children. And so, God, I pray that you would give us a little bit of indication, not only of this love, but really, Lord, of both parts of your character today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to uh, share with you uh, from this portion of Scripture just simply a message that I've entitled, The True Character of God. The true character of God. You know, a little while ago I was studying the Old Testament book of Job. And in that study, it's easy, literally, to get the impression 
that God is very arbitrary and very capricious. Very easy. That's not what, what we normally have in our minds when we think about God. That he is arbitrary or capricious. Now when I say arbitrary, a person who is arbitrary, it means that a person makes his decisions based solely on his own personal wishes, his feelings, his perceptions, rather than basing what he's doing on objective fact, reason, or any specific principles. And you know, when I studied the book of Job, I was impressed with the, find, with the, the fact that, that Job got very angry with God because he didn't feel that his suffering that he had to go through had any objective purpose whatsoever. They couldn't figure out, why in the world is this happening to me? There's no reason for it. But when we look at this thought of God being arbitrary, we look at Job and we, we see that God allowed Job to suffer for seemingly arbitrary reasons. The devil seems to coerce God to inflict all these problems on Job for no other th reason than a simple bet or a wager that he is placing between himself and the devil. That doesn't seem right. Now, when we read the story of Job, how God worked, it's easy for us to come to a conclusion that our God seems to be rather arbitrary. At least, sometimes he doesn't seem fair. Our God doesn't seem fair. Now when we think of the word capricious, we mean a capricious person does what he wants, when he wants, and to whom he wants, with very little care about the person that he is inflicting. And you know, we don't like to describe God that way. We, that's not something we, we want to say that he is a capricious God. Does what he wants, when he wants, to whom he wants, with very little care for the person that he is doing it to. That sounds more like, you know, Islam or Buddhism or some gods of nature or something of that. That sounds more like them. That doesn't sound like our God. Because we... we we look at our God as a God of real love and care and concern. And it is hard, and I throw this at you, to imagine, since we remember Jesus, what he was like, it's hard for us to get to that point where we want to worship a God that seems to be very wrathful, very judgmental, and angry so many times at so many people. It's hard for us to imagine that God after creating this beautiful earth and this glorious garden then, that he put Adam and Eve in, that he would just one day kick them out of the garden. Just kick them out of the garden into the, the desert because of only one sin that they committed. Hard to imagine that God would do that. It's hard for us to imagine that God would destroy the whole world except for eight righteous people and, and literally wipe out animals, wipe out people that were living on the earth at the time of Noah and his family. It's hard for us, I think, to imagine a God who would tell his commander, Joshua, to go into the land of Israel as they crossed over the Jordan, and you are to destroy all the people, men, women, and children, destroy all the people there in the land of Israel. Just destroy them. Don't take captives. Just destroy them. It's hard for us to imagine that we worship a God that could allow Satan to take a fellow like Job, who was blameless before God, and, 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 and wipe out all of his possessions, all of his health, all of his livelihood, and even the children that he had been given. I think most of us would rather believe that we have a God of love who's nice to us and friendly to us 
and wants our best and so on. A God of love. Not necessarily a God of wrath. I remember a wonderful Christian man who served with me uh, on the council and he, he was uh, in one of the churches that I served and uh, he, he came to me one day and and uh, because he really didn't like my preaching out of the Old Testament. And he says, I, I can't really believe in the God of the Old Testament. And I said, what? He says, I can't believe that that God in the Old Testament is the same God that we worship in Jesus in the New. And that we just, we see him in such a wrathful, angry uh arbitrary and capricious way in the Old Testament. And he says, I just, I cannot hold to that God in the Old Testament. Here's a guy that worked with us in the ministry and uh, loved the Lord and was willing to pour himself out. But he says, I cannot believe in, in a God that would destroy whole nations and treat his people in this way. To him, there was a definite separation. Now we know God is a God of love, but also we need to remember something else. And that is that we need to remember that we have a God of justice. God cannot tolerate sin. But because of his love for his creation, he knows what sin can do to us, and so he does whatever is necessary to keep us from falling into that sin. Let me give you a couple of examples. I told you about Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the garden. And we have a tendency to say, well, what in the world did he kick them out for? Just for one little sin? No, he kicked them out forever. I think we need to understand the point of view, not from our point of view, but rather from God's point of view. God loved Adam and Eve so much that he cast them from the garden for a specific reason. Let me read to you Genesis 3, 22 and 23 where it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden and he drove the man out. He did not want Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life and live forever in their sin. So he was willing to kick them out of the garden. It wasn't real pleasant for Adam and Eve, I can tell you that. But it was necessary. You know, when we are getting to the point of going home to be with Jesus in heaven, there is the tree of life planted by the river of water. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. And we will be eating from that tree, the tree of life, and it will allow us to live forever. God did not want that for Adam and Eve in their sin. And so naturally he kicked them out. Take a look at Noah and the flood is another example. What a cruel thing to do that God would destroy all of the people of this world except for eight people and a number of animals. Things didn't go his way so arbitrarily and capriciously he wiped out the whole earth. Is that really what happened? I think we understand, we need to understand what the scriptures say about the people in Noah's day. Again, let me read from Genesis in chapter 6. Then the Lord saw how the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh, not some flesh, but all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Sin had so taken control of the minds and the hearts of people, their actions had become so corrupt that there was no salvation left for them. They had gone too far. They had turned themselves completely away from God and God said, that's it. You know, sometimes I think we're not far from that now. You know, where we are so turning away from God and everything that God thinks is important. 
God loved his people, but in his justice, he cannot tolerate sin. And he knows what sin does to his creation. To the point, I want you to stop and think about this, to the point that this is what Jesus says to you and I today out of the New Testament. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Because it would be better for you to enter into eternity maimed than to go into hell. You know? Completely whole. He also said, you've got to remember something here about the devil. The devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Is he your buddy? No. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. He wants to get rid of you. But God says in that same verse, Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I'll tell you, I think that is just fabulous. All right, now, how are we going to have this fabulous life that he's talking about? Well, like it says in verse 27, I want to show you a still more excellent way. Our God is a God of justice. He hates sin. And we have a God who will pour out his wrath on a world of sin. But Jesus has come to show us a better way. To live, to have an abundant life, and to live righteous before God. That's what 13 is all about. He says, I can be a great orator, but without love, I am nothing. You know what I like to put in there instead? I am a nothing. That's what I am. I'm a nothing. If I can get up and preach a fabulous message but don't have love, I'm a nothing. He says, I can be brilliant. I can be filled with knowledge. But if I don't have love, I'm nothing. He says, I might have the strength to move mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. He says, I can be very benevolent, but if it's not done in love, it's worthless. It's worthless. There's no end to true love. None whatsoever. He says, and I want you to pursue love. Why? Because that's more like God than the God we see in the Old Testament. I like what it says in chapter 13. Now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest is love. Now it's not the greatest because it outlasts faith and hope. But it outranks everything, people. When we think about love, that outranks everything. That's the way we are to be dealing with all people at all times, no matter what. Why? Because you see, love, he says in this chapter, connects us to God. It connects us to God. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 says, If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 16 says, God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God is in him. I think it's because, you know what? Love is the greatest thing that we can get involved in. Learning how to love. Learning how to love our kids. Learning how to love our spouses. Learning how to love our neighbors who can be a real irritant. But you know, the, this, this idea of this dual nature of God is found even in that New Testament when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What did he give his only begotten son to do? He loved every one of us so much that he gave his son to do what? To die. I mean, there was, there was the justice of God. He said, listen, I can't accept any of these people unless somebody is willing to pay their life for all mankind. It has to be a perfect sacrifice. Sinless in every way. 
And Jesus said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And that's love. God says, all right, Jesus, you paid the price on that rugged cross called Mount Calvary. You took every sin that we have ever committed and you took it upon yourself. Everything was laid on Jesus. And it was at that moment that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. God's judgment, justice, anger, wrath had to come down on somebody. And Jesus said, but I don't want it to come down on these people. I am willing to pay the price. And because of that price, you and I can be set free. God so loved the world that he gave. Yes, we do have the justice of God. Uh, and I think we should worship the justice of God. He demands justice. But we also know that we have a God who has taken care of that justice. And a God who, although cannot stand sin, is willing to pay for that sin himself. You know, when we look at the dual character of God, his wrath, his anger, his justice, we should rejoice that he was that way. That we were willing to allow Jesus to pay for our sins. And he was willing to do so as well. So uh, when we talk about Jesus' love and, and, you know, that's very important. But we also need to know that Jesus and our God can't stand sin. And he will do anything to keep us from falling into sin. Sometimes he sends sickness. Sometimes he sends calamity. And I sometimes think that whenever we go into some of these problems that we have in our lives, we should ask ourselves, Lord, what are you keeping me from? What are you directing me to? Where are you sending me now? Because I am absolutely convinced there is a reason for every action that takes place within our lives. Every action. And the reason is God. So, do we have a God of justice? Yes. And we celebrate that even this morning. The fact that God was willing to pour out His wrath upon His Son, Jesus Christ, so that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's why we're going to take communion today, to worship that sacrifice that has been made for us this morning. Father, we would ask that you would grant us the understanding that you not only are a God of justice, but whatever we have to go through, whatever difficulties we have to experience, oh God, that you have a reason for it and you are protecting us and helping us to get away from the sin that so easily can beset us. And yet you do this because you love us. Oh God, that is absolutely awesome. You are an awesome God that love us that much. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen.